Hey, WTFFF listeners, this is Tracy Hazard, and I am coming to you with something that we promised you on our last podcast, and that was that we'd actually do a Facebook Live again. And we are sharing today, I'm sharing with you, the presentation I did at Inside 3D Print San Diego. Um, it was a presentation on disrupting retail. And this is not a one-on-one presentation. This is a, a little bit more insider information. Like it was, It's the kind that I normally would give to retailers or to others in the product design and development industry about retail. So anyway, I just wanted to start sharing that with you. And I really you know, want to set this up for you. There are a lot of people who said, oh, in retail, we're going to be buying 3D print products um, at – Target and Walmart, and now while the, that's happened occasionally, it's not tipped. It's not mainstream. It's not where we thought we would be by now. We thought that by 2020, it'd be like you were just printing stuff on demand, both in store and at home. And we don't really see that happening right now. Why is that? And what is it really going to take to make that happen? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm going to jump into little bits and pieces of the presentation and then come back and forth just because I want you to see some of the visuals and so you can get some ideas for some of the, the examples of things that we talk about. So I'm going to try and do this little switcheroo thing and make this work and the retail problem today. The retail problem today is really that, you know, products fail all the time. 14 out of 15 fail on HSN. Uh, we have... Um, Seven out of ten consumer products fail in the marketplace. And this is not just like individuals. Um, this is what happens at mass market. It happens when Target launches something. They don't have a really high success rate. So that's really one of the reasons why I think retail is primed to uh, be ready for it. The other, those of you who are inventors out there who are using 3D printing to make your um, prototypes and other things, only 2% of invention, inventions ever make money. So, you know, the odds are really stacked against you on this. But, and it's not you. It's also, you know, the consumer access, though. This is really where those big leaders have the advantage. So if you think you're going to disrupt it and you're going to build a whole brand new store and all of that, it's just an expensive proposition. So I really want to talk about a little bit about that because these guys still have the advantage. And if we can use them as startups, if we can use them to really disrupt themselves within that and leverage that what they already have, which is this fabulous consumer access, then really retail is going to be um, going to be the way to go to really make this happen faster and really make a tip. So here's a few of the retail ready signs. Showrooming is already going on. This is an example of Target. They did, they've they been doing some things where they're really planning on you to do just more of a order pickup and exchange and returns. And you would showroom. You would actually look through all of their various um, you know, products and you just test it out, more like an Apple Store model. And you would never actually see the products all out on the shelf and things there. So it's a quite a different model. And this is that they've accepted the fact that showrooming is happening and a lot of ordering is then happening online. But there is this site to store advantage. Both Walmart and Target are seeing that. Um, and it's part of the reason why Amazon has also bought um, bought Whole Foods because really that's, I mean, the ultimate site to store, right? You want to be able to just pick up in the store when it's food and it's something fresh. There's also a lot going on with last mile delivery. And while drones is an exa exaggeration of it, it really is um, more than just drones and other things. It's the fact that there's a warehouse within a, mi within a few miles of pretty much everyone in the U.S. And so when you think about that from last mile delivery, well, you really have a place by which you're getting so close that they're just really poised. But they also have a tremendous amount of warehouse space. So that's something that we're going to talk about. Um, and then we also have this idea of the rising cost per skew. And, I mean, costs are skyrocketing. These are just some of my examples of the cost per skew. And for those of you who aren't in the, in the lingo in the industry, skew means stock keeping units. So the costs are going up. There are high carrying costs, which means that how long that piece of inventory is in there requires insurance and security and shelf space and all of these things cost a, on, a, on a product. And it, so it's as long as it's there, it's costing them. And so that's also really important to think about. So if inventory costs are so high, then maybe the disruption is just right for it. But I hear the same things all the time. Why hasn't 3D printing taken off? It's because... 
consumers aren't ready yet, it's not fast enough yet, it's still less expensive to traditionally manufacture. But I pose the question that really, is that really true when we really look at those high costs of inventory and the high failure rate? Is it really? Now that may be absolutely the case on certain types of products. Um, furniture might be one of them, although they're high and expensive, they're too big. So there are various places in which this doesn't work. For, for the majority of products, it's really ready for these disruptive gaps to be exploited. And so here's some of those disruptive gaps. We have right fit design, skilled labor, product continuity, CPSC, which is the, computer, <laughs> the Consumer Product Safety Commission, um, safety issues, and shopping integration. These are some of the gaps and some of the reasons why we're not tipping as fast as we could be. And boy, I apologize for the sign, for the slide. I switched computers and it looks terrible on this computer. So this is why we have some issues with uh, right fit designs because I'm going to use the word crap like this, junk like this have come into the market as a, a test and they're failures. They're just not good examples of 3D printing. They're not even examples of stuff that people really want to buy. They cheapen it too much. They don't really make it custom and personal. They don't even make it just so that it's on demand, but it's an amazing, you know, an amazing choices that you have. You might have all sorts of design choices and all sorts of color choices because they don't have to carry the inventory on it. So the designs is the gigantic gap. And this is what Tom and I have been talking about again and again for the more than 500 episodes we've been talking about um, on WTFFF, and we've been talking about 3D print design. It's a problem. It's a huge problem, and they don't know how to do it, and they really can't handle it at retail because Walmart, Target, none of them have in-house design staffs. They haven't had them in years. They hardly even ever use design in any of the process. They rely on their vendors to bring them that, and if you're looking at the way that the model has been going, there's less and less designers in the process over the last decade and more direct shopping in China or in whatever country, Malaysia or other places where they might be finding these products, and so they're going direct to the factory. And in the decade that I've been going to China myself, um, I have yet to see a female designer who's designing in, that, in those factories. So when you look at mass market retail and you have 85% of consumer purchases are bought or influenced by women and there's zero female design sensitivity happening in that process, then we really don't have a representation of what will sell. And these kinds of products have been a huge miss. And it leaves a bad taste in the retailer's mouth that 3D printing is just not, not going to ever work for them. And that's a mistake. So this is a huge gap that needs to be filled in order for, in order for retail to truly be disruptive. Crowdsource design has been a huge failure as well. Why? Because, well, they're not paying enough is really the idea. These are not professional designers. They're kids out of school. They've never made products for mass market before. They don't know what consumers want to buy. They're not being guided by the retailers because the retailers don't know how to guide you. They don't do that type of 3D print product buy plan so that they tell you what to make. And so, you know, while some of them are very cute and whimsical and all of those things, they're not going to become mainstream. They're much more Etsy-level product at best. And so that's really not a, f a failure and it's not working. And if you don't pay professional designers to help you pull together a design catalog in this particular market, it's not going to work. Um, we also have, you know, this idea of um, that we have to bridge the buyers, right? That I was talking about that, that there are buyers there that are in control of the design process and control of what products get placed. And we have to bridge them because they don't understand how to buy 3D print products, how to buy designs that way. It's not in the, the way that they work. It just is not in their measurement. And so um, in how the, their job is measured, right? Now, I think a way to do that is to start talking about lower inventory costs, and that may be the best way, and, and maybe going from test product into um, into mass marketed product. But then you have to have a design that not just is 3D printed, but perhaps could also be uh, mass produced as well in some other method. So this is a this is an area that we really have to touch on and really a lot needs to be done to help buyers understand how they're going to be buying this products and these designs in the future. So we know we have a skilled labor gap mostly because that it's being done in these silos in within a box and I, I want to say that because 
education is has its own box and it's just a it's just kind of a mismatch between uh, where we need the skills and where we're learning the skills so like they're just not they're not in the same place so we need to have we need to stop having silos we need to stop having these boxes and we need to have product designers who've been design, designing for mass market retail and or buyers and all of those people are educated in that and that world of actual product design that's happening today to start talking to the 3d designers and we need 3d designers to get out from behind their computer and walk into factories and understand how something needs to be made in order to make it future manufacturable because at the end of the day volume still counts at mass market retail so while there is a place and there's definitely a starting point for it we really have to move that along and in that, we need development continuity, and this is a huge problem Tom and I have found as we've been working with some clients. So we've been trying to design product where we, we 3D print them in the design process, we make small runs, maybe we use Shapeways or Sculptio, and we use a service bureau, and we zero in on these great colors and these great designs, and now we want to test them in the marketplace. So we want to go from this level of quality of print to like the higher quality, uh, more ma more of what I'm going to call volume produced 3D print versions. And when we go to that, we can't go into production in the same colors because the people who do these larger 1,000 plus runs, 10,000 piece plus runs, tend to not do color. They just want to make it white. And that doesn't work in this. We need to have a better continuity through the whole development process and understand how to design a product that can go can be can go from our, our 3D print and the design side of things to test runs and a slightly larger volume, and then even be mass manufactured after that in larger volume when they really work. And that continuity is missing, as well as what I would call you know sort of like the development management or SKU management stock keeping unit management. We don't have a management of the complexity throughout that process as well. Um, it's coming. And there are various softwares and other things working on that right now, but it hasn't come along far enough to really being in the hands of the designers, developers, and buyers in the process and becoming integrated into retail. So that's a big opportunity gap. Another big gap that we have is the colors, materials, and finishes, as I talked about just before, that when we can't have any color we want, when we can't match a Pantone or a corporate color, or we can't have glossy and matte, and we can't have these multiple finishes, and there isn't post-processing available, then we really don't have an ability to print on demand. It's not going to work unless we can actually finish the products to a level that a consumer expects. And this is where we're falling apart a lot here. Um, and there are lots of companies who have been working on that, really excited about Form Alloy um, and their metal finishing capabilities um, and their metal uh, overprinting and other things that they do. So they get in a lot of capability there. Um, and then you combine that with some traditional polishing or other things, and now we have something that can be mass produced. Um, and, you know, there are other people like Lucy Beard from Feats who are doing some great things with making things that are um, m just re-engineering materials to make them better. And so we, we need a lot more work here in order to really satisfy and do a broader gamut of products. Then, of course, we have safety and testing, right? So um, this is an example. Tom and I were uh, called in on a client's project um, where they had – a CPSC recall on bean bags. These are the little pellets that are in your bean bags, and two children died from suffocating with those bean with those little pellets, and that's horrendous and horrible. Um, and it, but at the same time, the manufacturer had an issue. As you can see, there's like a little zipper there. That zipper should not be able to be to come apart, and they were using just sort of like a. I don't know, it was like a big old staple, like an industrial staple that was attaching the two pieces together. And so, of course, kids were able to defeat that. And the client was going to be losing a, a placement of over $20 million to their bottom line every single year um, at that they were not, no longer able to make these, these beanbags that their whole company was, was built around. And so they came to us and we redesigned the zipper portion of it. These are things that if you weren't in the industry, if you haven't been doing this a long time, if you don't understand the testing model, we can't just make 3D print products, push them out in the market, and not have an understanding of the safety concerns. We can't. We have to have test protocols. All of those things need to happen, and they not only need to happen on the design level, 
but they also need to happen on the product production level. Because if at the end of the day you can produce a product that has a problem at, in the production of it, in the manufacturing of it, or the on-demand printing of it, um, we need to be able to check for that. We need to be able to check for flaws and all of those things. So that part of the process also is a very big opportunity gap for someone to be really pioneering something and, and making the ability to disrupt retail work. Uh, retail integration, biggest gap we have going for us and the most important. If we can integrate straight where people are already shopping and you don't have to get them to come to your store. I think that sort of like the idea that people are going to switch over and start shopping at Shapeways or shopping at any one of these new retailers that are popping up, it's an expensive proposition. And especially if it's only 3D print products, people aren't really in that. They want to shop for convenience, women especially. And if I'm already in the store, it needs to absolutely be integrated. One of the huge failures Tom and I saw over the last couple of years was when Amazon separate out, separated out and had the 3D print product store. And I understand why they did it logistically. It was problematic because it was a whole custom, uh, you know, interface that they were designing in terms of a user interface. And so I understand that. But when someone can't just search in their normal search model on Amazon and just find a 3D print product and it doesn't matter how it's made because, I mean, think about this. We do not label our products uh, injection molded, uh, rotationally molded, aluminum cast. We don't label products like that. So why do we want to label them 3D printed? No one should care. It just should just be that this product is being delivered to us. We bought it from the place we wanted it. It's being delivered to us in this in prime, you know, two day shipping, whatever that is. And it's and who cares if it's not coming off of a shelf? It's coming off of a machine. All the better. Uh, it's a more sustainable solution. So that's really the the ideal way that I see that um, if we get to that stage, then it's going to tip into retail. It's going to be really easy. And this is the other reason why. I want to just use an example that I, I use all the time. Um, this is uh, someone who came to me, and they were making this amazing aquaponic lettuce. And this lettuce was grown with 50% less water. And it just had all these amazing features. And, um, and they were scaling this up, and they were trying to go for venture capital. And they were giving me this whole pitch about how wonderful it was. And they were like, and we're going to be able to sell it for cheaper. And I looked at them, and I said, you're not going to do that from the get-go, are you? And they said, yeah, of course we are. I said, mm, let's think about this. And it is the same problem we saw when we looked at that $16 rose being sold on Amazon, right? I mean, I'm sold on Walmart. If you put side by side something that's new, that people don't understand, that they haven't tried yet, and you put it next to something that they trust, and you make it cheaper, people think it's less quality. I mean, if I looked at these two, I'd be on the shelf at, uh, you know, Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or something. I'd be looking at it and I'd go, hmm, it's grown with less water. That sounds cool, but I bet it it's a dollar cheaper, so I bet it doesn't taste good. And so when you can't sell head-to-head -head and provide value, so I'm not saying you have to be more, but being the same, then you can't get a proper test of whether or not people are interested in your product. And so that's where we have to do. We can't keep relegating 3D print products to somewhere else and keep them separated and force them to be cheaper. It's just not, it's just not a model that will work, not with consumers. So I am going to escape out here, and, and we are just – and I am going to try to figure out how to get back to where you guys are. Oh, I see you. There you go. I'm <laughs> back. So that was really what I wanted to, what I presented there. I had a quick 20 minutes and, um, you know, so it was not a lot of time and there was a lot of questions and some of the questions were about typical things that we talk about all the time is like, is 3D printing fast enough? Why aren't there enough designers? Um, you know, what's going on there? How can I help? And, um, and you know what I've been hearing lately that I'm really excited about? As I keep presenting these gaps and these other things, and we've been talking about various things, some of you are coming up with some great business ideas to fill these gaps. And I'm so thrilled with that. I, I don't expect to fill them. I expect everyone else to group together and us to build that together. And then we'll really get through this. We're going to get through the right fit design, and we're going to get through that skilled labor gap, and we're going to help each other train and get that cross-functional training that's required. And we're going to get all that production capability we need to really make 3D printing a retail reality. And I'm telling you out there, I've been doing retail for 25 years, designing products for this, and they need what 
the potential of what 3D printing can do. So it is up to us, guys, on WTFFF listeners and 3D Start Point Facebook Live people who are listening today. It's up to us to make this happen and keep plugging away with your business ideas and your great designs. And please send me some feedback. Let me know what you think. Let me know if this was valuable to you. And, you know, we're, we'll try and do this maybe on a monthly basis. I would love for that. So have a great weekend, and thanks so much.